Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Luke Kayam, and for those of you that don't know me, I am here on this planet to inspire, teach, and educate as many people as possible. And I am so excited to be here today with my guest, Sky Bergman, who has created this documentary film on living a long life called Lives Well Lived. Welcome, Sky. Thank you so much for having me. And you look very comfortable. Where are we coming from today? San Luis Obispo. <laughs> Beautiful. Good old slow in California. Awesome. Yeah. And what's the weather like out there? Uh, it's pretty nice. We had a couple really hot days, but right now it's pretty, we're pretty lucky. It's pretty nice out here. <laughs> well, if you know anything about Scottsdale where I am right now. Yeah, it's all relative, right? Yes, it's relative. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Both AC units have been replaced twice this summer and uh, wow. I'm sweating right now. So <laughs> yeah, it's but pretty I'm nice standing out here. up, but I am <laughs> standing up, which means I've already started the process of living a long life. <laughs> I am inspired by longevity. I have, you know, built most of my career in the health and fitness industry along long-term results. And when I meet people, it might, my, my, my fitness career literally started with a good friend of ours, mm -hmm. Maxine Spurgeon in Palm Desert, California in 1999. And I started teaching senior citizens how to move. And, and the program was called Light and Right with Luke. And we would do things as simple as arm raises and small stretches throughout the body. Never knowing 19, 20 years later, I would be here interviewing you who's created this film that's shifting, that's changing the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. Things that are very simple and basic to your grandmother, for example. So tell us about how you got inspired to shoot this film. Yeah, sure. So I should say this is my first film. I'm a first time filmmaker, and uh, which means that anyone can do this, really. <laughs> and I really started doing videos because my grandmother was an amazing cook. And as all good cooks, she never wrote a recipe down. So I thought, well, if I really want to know how to make what she is making, because she was in her 90s, I better video her because she'd say it's a handful of that and a handful of this. And I, I said, well, can I measure your hand, you know? And so I really started my foray into this, really this whole project by videoing my grandmother cooking. And when she was getting ready to turn 100, I went back with her. She lived in Florida. She came out to visit me in California. And... Um, I, she, her usual routine was to go to the gym every, like three times, three or four times a week. And she was working out on her exercise bike. And I thought I better film this because nobody's going to believe that at almost a hundred years old, she's still working out at the gym and lifting her little weights. And as a throwaway comment, I said to her, Hey grandma, can you give me some words of wisdom? And that was really the beginning of the, the end as they say. <laughs> um, and I came back from that trip and I put together a little one minute video of her working out at the gym and her words of wisdom, which were things like be kind and live life to the limits. And she also had a phrase, move it or lose it, which I think is a very good one. Um, and I thought, you know, there's, there is a project here. I want to find other people out there in the world that are as much an inspiration as my grandmother is to me. And so I sent an email out to all my friends and family and all the alum that I've taught over the years that I've taught at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And I said, if you have somebody that's as much an inspiration as my grandmother is to me, please nominate them. And the heartwarming thing was I was just inundated by nominations. And that really started the project. I didn't know it was going to be a film. I thought it was going to be maybe a web series or something. But um, in the end, I realized it really deserved and needed to be a, a feature length film. Amazing. And it took you four years to film in total? It took me four years to film and then another year of re-editing it. And then it's been a year of kind of getting it out in the world. So I've been working on it for six years at this point. <laughs> uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, we started this conversation, uh, I think about six months ago. Yeah. And I've just seen the momentum build and build and build. Uh, tell us, where was the first theater? Where was the first place that actually showed it? And then tell us where it's been growing. I know you've done sure. things across California and of course, New York now. Mm -hmm. And and how, you know, what is it looking like? What, when is the tour beginning? Like what, <laughs> what's happening now in your world? And yeah. how are you delivering this message uh, everywhere sure. that you go? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the great thing is that um, I, I did show it in smaller versions 
um, at a really lovely theater that we have here. I'm just putting a plug out for the Palm Theater in San Luis Obispo because Jim D. who owns it is incredibly wonderful to independent filmmakers. And we did some fundraisers. Um, I showed it at the, just a small 12 minute part of it at the Slow Jewish Film Festival. And then we showed a sneak preview at the San Luis Obispo Film Festival um, a couple, about a year and a half ago. And I wanted to do that. I knew the film wasn't done, but I'm dealing with an aging population. I want to make sure they all had a chance to see it. And that was amazing. My grandmother was able to come. Actually, she was 103 and a half at the time. And she flew out from Florida to California. And she got to see the film along with 26 other people that were in the film. I ended up interviewing 40 people for the film. So most of the people that were in the film were there that night. Um, but I did show it with the intention of knowing that it really, um, I handed out feedback forms to everyone and um, really wanted to rework the film and knew that I needed some, some changes. So um, I took another, I took all those feedback forms. We had an 850 person sold out seating thing. Wow. It was amazing. And we got about 200 feedback forms turned in. And uh, really they confirmed kind of what I already knew, which were the things that I needed to work on and change and, and re-edit and rework. And so I took the next year and really we worked, we worked the whole film. So it was kind of a, I mean, it was a similar idea, but really tightened up. And we, so as a result, we got into the Santa Barbara Film Festival um in 2017 now we launch of our um our whole thing with the film and we've won a whole bunch of awards at film festivals i think we're up to 10 at this point wow. and we released uh, in theaters starting february of this year and just about every theater that we have shown in they've held it over so they guarantee a week and then it just keeps going i mean you know in here in san luis obispo it ran for nine weeks um, or eight, it was eight weeks. And then in, in um, Palm Desert, I think it was out there for five or six weeks. And I mean, everywhere, it's just like beyond anyone's wildest expectations. And so next week we're opening in New York City, which is really quite, quite lovely. Yeah, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> yeah, awesome. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously we have a lot to talk about and I, I want to stay somewhat focused because I feel like I could have this conversation with you <laughs> for hours, but for the people who are watching this, for the viewers that are going to watch it on, on YouTube and Facebook, you know, let's just get right into mm -hmm. where can they find out more information about the film and about the website and how can they learn more? Because what I find in, in my business in, in coaching people, regardless of what age they're at, people want to improve. They, mm -hmm. they want to know that they're learning something, that they're adapting principles and those principles are going to help them develop into greater, faster, stronger, smarter, older versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. So this book, or excuse me, this film has that in it where it is an education piece. Yes, you're inspiring people with the stories of 40 people, but they're also teaching. Each one of those people inside of this film is a teacher. Right, that's true. So the, the best thing to do is start off with the website, which is lives-well-live.com, or if you just Google Lives Well Lived, it's the first thing that comes up. Um, on the website, you can sign up for our email newsletter list. And every, I try and send out something every month and I put a word of wisdom from one of our film stars. So my favorite quote from the film star. So you get a little surprise every month when you get our, our newsletter. Um, there's also, you can see our, our trailer on the um, website and where we're, where we're gonna be screening everywhere. Um, we're starting community and educational screenings next month in August. So if you know of a place that you have an organization that wants to sponsor a screening, um, that's certainly something that you can reach out. My contact info is on the website. And, um, and let me know and we can try and set something up because I think that that's a, you know, theaters are one place to show the film, but I think getting it out into communities um, and into schools and, and doing some of that, I think is really vitally important. And the other thing that I would say is if you, after you've seen the film or even after you've seen the trailer, um, if you think of somebody that would have been perfect for this film, which I always ask audiences that 98% of the hands go up, um, one of the things that I did is I realized I had to stop interviewing people where I'd never get a film finished. <laughs> and so what I did was to be more inclusive rather than exclusive. There's a place on the website where you can actually share your story or share the story of someone else. Oh, and really it, there's about um, 10 of the 20 something questions that I asked everyone that you can use. Cause I think mm -hmm. the hardest thing is like, I would love to create a movement where we start interviewing our elders. I think that that's lost. That connection is lost a bit. And sometimes the hardest thing is to know where to start. And so at least having those questions is a pretty good starting point. Yeah, that's awesome. So you talk about the power of proximity and how the 
through the internet. We're all connected. Uh, I posted just a couple hours ago that I was going to be doing this interview. And my cousin, who's of Lebanese descent, who, who lives in San Luis Obispo, says she watched the film last spring. Oh, well, cool. <laughs> her, her grandmother lived to be 98. Uh, my grandmother was around 89 or 90. Mm -hmm. And we still have a living family member who's 103. Wow. Back in the Middle East. My question to you is this, for the, the 40 people that you interviewed, uh, obviously you have different races, religions, sexes, you have different ages. What was the common theme that you really felt stood out more than anything else amongst those 40 people? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'll tell you, you know, I was approaching my 50s, I'm now 52, but at the time I was approaching my 50s as I was doing the film and thinking like, how, how do I be like these people? You know, I mean, that was part of the impetus for wanting to do this film is that I wanted to kind of have a roadmap of how to live well and how to be like my grandmother 100 and happy and healthy and you know all these things and so um i really did look for those commonalities and i think i ended up there were three things that all these people had in common um the first thing i think was that they all were passionate about doing something every day so you know, learning something new um and and doing something every day whether it was cooking painting activism, um, whatever it was, they had something that they looked forward to doing and learning more about. And then the second thing I think is that they had a good sense of community. They weren't isolated. That they could be friends. It didn't necessarily have to be family, but they had a, a sense of community and belonging. And then I think um, the third thing, which is such a cliche, but there's a reason it's a cliche, is that they all saw life as the glass is half full rather than half empty. So when you watch the film, you'll see these people live through some really horrific events, but how did they face that and how did they overcome that and still remain incredibly positive in the midst of great adversity? Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a lesson for all of us because I know yeah. now I live my life and I think of, I call them like first world problems. You know, I have these problems which seem monumental until mm -hmm. I go, okay, wait, take a giant step back. And this is so not that important. Um, I think the thing that I personally learned from doing the film um, is really to live in the moment and to appreciate each and every moment. I think that that um, more than anything resonated with me. I mean, things also did, but I, I think. Uh, being in my 50s now, I just learned to step back and just take that time. And I have to say that at the end of every day now, I sit and I think about at least three things that I'm grateful for that happened during the day. Yeah. And it just makes the whole day so much brighter and better because I can reflect back on these, you know, the wonderful things that sometimes we often overlook just because we're so busy in our lives. And I'm certainly... Uh, have been, you know, guilty of that and having a very busy lifestyle. But I think just learning to slow down and really appreciate it because in the end, the thing that we have are our memories, you know, and that's, that's what we want. Um, to resonate. So yeah, as we first started this interview, my phone popped up my calendar invite, which says disconnect to reconnect something that I have every Saturday at 4pm until Sunday at 10am. And I talk about it with everybody to completely unplug from the matrix, as we often say, of just constant going, mm -hmm. going, going, going. As you get older, you have more availability to slow down. But, you know, my younger self 10, 20 years ago would never have thought about putting my device away so that I can just be present. Of all the different commonalities, of all the different you know, sort of tips and tools and hacks and habits that mm -hmm. these 40 people have. Was there anything that you took home with you and began implementing yourself? Well, I mean, I think that um, my, I, I, you know, it's my grandmother, but I think her phrase of move it or lose it, I think really uh, hit home for me. And that was kind of what started me on this whole journey because um, I, I do really the hot yoga, the Bikram yoga. And there are days when I think, oh my God, I'm just too tired. And I just think of my grandmother and her at a hundred and plus going to the gym and working out. And I think of her saying, move it or lose it. And it just gets me inspired to go and get out of bed and, um, and keep moving my body because I think that that's really important for me. I'm, I'm very physical and I like to be able to move and walk and do the things that I want to do. And, I, I'm a photographer, so I want to be able to carry all my heavy camera gear. And uh, so I move it or lose it. You know, I think that that's really important. That being said, there were people in the film that were, um, had physical limitations. I mean, I think everybody does as we get older. 
I think the reason that they remained positive is because they looked at the things that they could do and were grateful for the things that they could still do rather than resent the things that they couldn't do. I mean, my grandmother certainly was one of those people. She, at the end of her life, was walking with a walker and she had macular degeneration, but yet she was grateful for the things that she could do and she still went to the gym. In fact, her, um, her trainer would say, people would come into the gym and they'd say, oh, I'm too old to be working out. And she'd say, wait, let me introduce you to our 100-year-old, you know, and then say if you think you're still too old. <laughs> so how old was she? Uh, one of my questions obviously was about your grandma, who uh, mm -hmm. is the poster child for the film, correct? Yeah, literally, yes, quite yeah. literally, yes. <laughs> how old was she when she passed away? She was 103 and a half. So as I said, she came out to California for the screening of the film and she was the belle of the ball all dressed up and meeting and greeting the 850 uh. people that came into the theater which is <laughs> lovely and she passed away peacefully six weeks later she said she was done she stopped eating and drinking and she was gone in two days mm -hmm. and I think you know there a friend of mine um, Roger Landry wrote a book called live long die short and I think that that's really um she was definitely um, a good example of that. She lived right to the end. And then, you know, she really literally just said, I am, I'm done. And yeah. she had done what she wanted to do. I think her, my mom said she wanted to live long enough to see the film on the big screen, which she did. And um, so although I was sad that she passed away and I miss her every day, I'm in a way very happy that she chose that and that it wasn't something that happened to her and that she really actively made that decision. And I think, you know, that's a conversation we don't have very often is about death. And one of the questions that I actually asked all the people in the film is, what do you think about your own mortality? And in fact, my dad is one of the people that I interviewed and I would never have asked him that question mm. otherwise. But I think it's very important that we do ask those questions because I, you know, I had asked that question to my grandmother and I knew her thoughts and I had the same with my dad. And so it makes it a lot easier when that time comes to be at peace with it, I guess, you know, I think yeah. that that's, we just, we kind of tend to gloss over that and try and do what we can to keep the person alive at whatever cost. But yeah. in reality, that might not be really what they want. And um, so it, it was tough to like, not um, want to do everything that I could to say to my grandmother, no, 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 you have to keep living. But you know, she really, she was very clear and as stubborn as she was in life and, and, and her, making it to that age she was just that stubborn that that's what she wanted to do so that's it was so it was powerful yeah. <laughs> yeah it's amazing and i don't know if you've even had a chance to reflect on what you were able to give your grandma towards the end of her life like that in itself what i started thinking of was you know my my grandmother personally passed away uh with with the live long die long and mm. that 10 years that decade of her, you know, post car accident. And again, accidents happen. We never truly know, you know, what's going to happen to us. And it wasn't her fault. However, those 10 years were rough on everyone. And when you think about like Alzheimer's and these different painful parts of reality that happened, you, your grandma was at the front door with her face on the poster. Like you were able to give her that. So I honor you just for a moment. I know you're, you're, you're in this mode of, you know, this is the film and this is what we did, but that is magical. Yeah, I know. It's really, I feel really grateful. I always tell my friends that I feel very grateful. That, uh, I think, that, I mean, I always loved my grandparents. We lived with my grandparents for years and then very close by them. And even my great grandmother lived to be 97 and I was 19 when she passed away. So I knew, knew all of them pretty well. And my grandparents on my dad's side as well. Um, but I always say that my, my grandmother, I feel so lucky that she lived long enough for me to be old enough to really appreciate her. And um, my grandfather had passed away 10 years earlier, and I kind of made it my mission to make sure that she was never alone and that we, we did a lot of trips together. When she turned 100, my mom and I took her to Europe, to Italy, so she could see all the relatives one last time and spend a month on a cruise coming back, because that's what her and my grandfather used to do. And, you know, there's little things that what a what a joy it was for me to have that extended time with her and and like i said i was old enough to realize how valuable that it was because i think when you're younger you're you just you don't understand that and you're raising your kids and all that other stuff and uh, that for that period of time i had the luxury of really being able to give my focus to her i mean we had this kind of crazy thing where um i don't even know how it started 
we would, uh, she would read my horoscope to me every morning and her horoscope. And so I would check in with her every day and we try and figure out how our day aligned with our horoscopes. But more, it was a, it was really just that sweetness of checking in and telling each other what our days were going to be like. And, you know, it just, I, I love that. It was lovely. Yeah. yeah. That's so awesome. Okay. So we got to switch gears here and talk about this country that we live in uh, yeah. with, with, with the good, the bad and the ugly comes sure. the conversation. We know about obesity, we know about diabetes, we know about health and at the speed and acceleration of how it's happening in front of us, you, you have this stone, you have this pebble that you're throwing into this giant pond. How can we, where do we go from here? And, and let's just take yourself out of the movie for a moment and that's a tool how do we change? And is there a way to even change what's happening at this pace? Yeah, I, you know, that's a tough question because I had these very interesting conversations with my grandmother. We would go to the farmer's market here in San Luis Obispo on Thursday night, which is legendary. And um, she loved to buy all the fresh fruits and vegetables and then we would cook the next day. And she would kind of um, laugh at me because I would always get organic, you know, and she said, oh, you don't need to spend the money on organic. And I finally said to her, you know, grandma, when you grew up, everything was organic. <sighs> there wasn't, and, and, and then she got it. But I think that that's the problem is that we have been, because one of the things that she would also say is she never ate processed food. And again, you know, we're in this society where everything is so fast paced that we don't take the time to cook food. And being around her, she came out here four summers in a row, starting when she was 96 and would spend a month with me out here. Wow. And we would cook together. And it really got me um, back to the basics of like really thinking about what I was putting in my body and, and w knowing where my food came from. And, um, and I bought her a little exercise bike so she could exercise while she was out here. And, you know, and I, that was important to her. Yeah. And so seeing what kept her going, I think, um, really has changed the way that I eat and I live. So um, I also try not to eat any processed food and make my own food. And it takes longer. But, you know, it's one of those things where I think the only thing that in, in your life that you can kind of control, like your health is the most important thing. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Yeah. So if you can control what you put in your body and that's going to control your health, by all means, that should be a priority. If it can be, not everybody can, you know, not everybody has that luxury. So I, um, I know I'm lucky that I have mm -hmm. the time to cook and that I have the time to go get fresh fruit and vegetables. And again, not everybody does. I think it's a shame in this country that if you go to poorer neighborhoods, they don't have grocery stores. They have, you know, convenience stores that that's all they sell is junk food. And so that um, perpetuates the problem, unfortunately. It's a, yeah. it's a tough, tough situation. Yeah, definitely a socioeconomic, you know, challenge in America. But right. when, when you have a tool like yours, you know, I know the big picture here is not to necessarily, you know, get more openings in the film. It's to get this film out to the country and to the world to educate this generation. And, you know, I think about, I grew up, my mom was a hippie child of the, the, the 60s and 70s. And I was born on that cusp where in 78, there was still enough friction going on that my mom was able to take me out of Cedar sinai without a social security number because she wow. didn't want me to get drafted. So I grew up in this organic yoga environment between Hawaii and California. And at, at times when I was in my 20s, I thought it was crazy. Now, having kids of my own, I unplug the Wi-Fi. We don't use the microwave. There is minimal plastic. Like, we do everything possible. And I talk about if you can keep everything under 10 ingredients a day, you're going to be able to prolong your life. And that's from the toothpaste to the deodorant to the things that you're eating. Simple ingredients. And we've educated our kids and, you know, our community. But it's hard to beat the corner store. It's hard to beat, you know, the, the free donuts and coffee and creamer that, that are in front of everybody. Right. Education sure. seems to be the only way that you could possibly do that. Where do you see this film in 10 years, in a decade? Because you're obviously not stopping. This is a mission. This is your purpose. <laughs> you can see it. You can feel it. Your grandma is going to be a part of this legacy for a long time. Yeah. Where do you see this film? Well, I mean, I would love to get it into, um, you know, community centers and education centers and schools. That's really important. I think that um, if you look at our history, 
the last hundred years is the first time in human history that we've looked to anyone other than our elders for advice. Mm -hmm. And I really think the world is suffering as a result. And so one of my um, goals for the film is to really reconnect that intergenerational dialogue and ha have that happen. Because I think that we can learn so much from our elders if we just take the time to listen. And so I would love to see it get into junior high, high schools, colleges, uh, show the film and then have them do a project where they have to interview somebody that's 75 and older mm -hmm. and you know use I, I worked with a bunch of people at Cal Poly to come up with the questions that I asked everyone so I have a group of questions that I you know can be a, a starting point um, for doing those interviews and I, I just think it would enrich their lives so much and not only that but I think um, one of the things that I really found fascinating was I've had some panel discussions now with some of the people that were actually in the film where people wanted to you know talk to all of us and the, a couple of the people in the film just said how important it was for them to tell their stories because it gave them a sense of validation and that they were able to share their story so it was just as important for them to share it as it was for me to hear it which i found very interesting because at the end of your life you want to feel like it's meant something and i think yeah. when somebody interviews you and takes the time to actually listen to what your life was about it makes you feel like your life was 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 worthy of something yeah. and, and worthy of passing along that that sage advice yeah so I, I i had zero parents zero grandparents at 24 years of age wow and had I not had this business, the business of, of training seniors and really, you know, the ability of, to communicate with people. Since that day, since I was young, I always looked up to my elders. And even though I didn't have personal ones, grandma, grandpa, it was the clients, it was the seniors, it was my friend's dad and mom. It was those people that I would go to and just ask questions. And now, you know, here I am about to turn 40 in a few months and I'm looking and calling and talking to the people who have experienced life more than I have, because it's so true. I mean, you put it in perfect context, like to reconnect the intergenerational dialogue, like that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. And yet it's not something that's often spoken about or, you know, even brought up in conversation, you know, the dinner table, right? This place that <laughs> was once sacred, whether it was a Sunday night or a weeknight or every single night is now a stand up island where, you know, we eat on the go or we eat out. And one of the things that I had on my goals list for last year was to have one dinner night a week with all four of us, the, our family together. Are there tools and tips inside of the website that really, you know, give people access to some of, you know, the master plans of what these 40 people in their, their themes, like, you know, eat your vegetables, drink water, like, do, is, is that in there yet or is that coming? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that is on the website is if you go to our film stars page, all of the 40 people that were interviewed, um, I have my, what I think is a quote that resonates the most. And they're, what I think was their biggest takeaway for, from each of those people. So like um, Dr. Lou Tadone, who he's going to be 95 next week. He was a pediatrician here in town, but he makes fresh mozzarella every morning. <laughs> he works out before he makes the mozzarella and he's just a lovely man. Um, but his, my favorite quote, was one of my favorite quotes in the movie. He says, happiness is a state of mind. You can be happy with what you have or miserable with what you don't have. Mm. You decide. Yeah. And so um, if you go to the website, you can see that, but you can also see all the other ones from the, the people that I interviewed. And I hope that um, in the shared stories, there's some of that as well. So I hope that that continues to grow as the film gets out there in the world and it, you know, people start adding and sharing stories and sharing wisdom. So I'm hoping this kind of can be a repository for all that wonderful wisdom. Yeah. And, and you could be, you know, spearheading the longevity foundation in colleges because yeah. they're not teaching this, right? No, like, no, they're not. They're not. And it's really a shame. Um, um, it's sort of like, I think that the, the problem that I see um, in terms of like films and when people talk about aging, um, it's really interesting to me is that people will say, um, oh, they're, they're like at the end of the spectrum, right? So it's either they're really young because they've done this thing or they're really old because they've done this thing and oh my God. And if you're in between, it doesn't matter that you've done whatever you've done, like run a marathon or just, you know, they'll say, so, oh, somebody was like a hundred years old and ran a marathon or somebody was 10 and, you know, and then there's this kind of gray area in between. So there's like the outliers and that's mm. what we hear more about in terms of aging, either people that are doing things that are really remarkable for their age or people, 
not doing well since their age. And we don't hear about the everyday people that are just doing a great job, but they're not doing anything necessarily extraordinary. They're just doing an amazing job of living. And I think that's what the film has captivated. And, um, and I think it also tells their stories and we hear their history. I mean, one of the things that was really important to me was to, to um, when you see the film, you hear the histories of all these people, not all of them, I picked about 10 of them to really delve into something that happened to them that was really relevant. And one of them is um, Susie Edo Bauman, who is Japanese American and was interned during World War II because she was of Japanese descent. She was born in this country, but of Japanese descent. And I think it's important for us to hear those stories so that not just from a health perspective, but from a political perspective and a, and a cultural perspective, yeah. that we don't, as a culture, make those same mistakes again. I mean, yeah. some of we can learn from we can learn from our history a little bit. Yeah, you're teaching history as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. So when I grow up, I've always said this, but I want to be a centenarian. I, my goal is <laughs> is a hundred years old. And uh, one of the things I tell my clients when I first kind of onboard them in this is like you're going to need to eliminate a lot of things in order to add some of these new ideas and concepts because we have been raised in this, you know, fast paced, the microwave works, the plastic is fast, the Starbucks. I mean, uh, I don't drink Starbucks anymore unless I have to, but mm -hmm. Starbucks starting in Seattle went with paper straws now. Right. And, and we could go down this, you know, rabbit hole of plastic and the environment and the eco center that we live in, but that's a step. That's a major step. Mm -hmm. what, what steps need to happen immediately? And I know, again, we could go down this rabbit hole, but if, if you were, you know, in charge of the world starting mm -hmm. tomorrow, what would you say would be something that you could say to everybody? Hey guys, do this, do this one thing and do it well. And you're going to see your life just absolutely unfold in front of you. Well, see, I think that that's where it's a little bit different um, for me anyway. And I think that's why the film is so successful because it's not just about any one person. Mm. And I think that there are 40 different people and you might not resonate with one person, but you resonate with another. So, you know, there's another woman who was a former professor of mine who um, her mission in life was to, she collected all the non-biogradable trash in Santa Barbara and had a big exhibition of that. 30 years ago, way ahead of her time. Yeah. And then she realized, well, I want to make plastic highways with this. And she got a patent and did it. So, you know, so there's that environmental aspect. And then there's the, you know, Susie's story. And there's all these different stories. And so I think the problem is there's not one particular message. Everybody is going to resonate with something different. And I think that you know, as I say with exercise, like for me, my love is to do the Bikram yoga. That's the thing that for 30 years now has really kept me centered and kept me good. And, but for somebody else, it might be swimming or for somebody else, it might be running. And I think it's no matter what it is, as long as you do that thing, you find that thing and you do it. So you're not just sitting on the sidelines and that you're engaged. And I would say the same thing in terms of, you know, the question that you asked, it's like, I don't think there's one particular sure. thing. I think it's going to depend on the person and, and what they're capable of doing and what is going to, cause we're all so unique and, and why not, use that uniqueness to our benefit and, and do the thing that really um, is going to make you happy, but also is going to help other people and serve other people at the same time. That's a great answer. Con consistency and variety, not yeah. one or the other. <laughs> All right. So we started out with the basic information of how they can watch the film, of, of how they can go to the website, but let's just talk a little bit more about you and your background and where you are today and how they can reach you, how they can follow you and how they can learn more about you. Cause you're obviously, you're very inspiring. You, you walk the talk. This has been your life. Like this is going to consistently be your life yeah. and part of your legacy. So you're not going anywhere. This message isn't going anywhere. You're in this for the long game. Yes. And, and tell us just uh, whether it's your social media or, you know, some of the courses that, that you're teaching, just give us a, a, a quick one or two minutes sure. on, on who you are and your background as a photographer. Sure. Well, I'll start out with my background as a photographer, because I think that um, one of the things that I've learned and that my mom has always taught me is to follow your dreams. And I, um, my undergraduate degree is actually in business. I took a photo class just for fun my last semester. 
And I realized, oh my God, this is what I want to do. And I, not only that, but I, that I wanted to teach. And so I went to my um, professor at the time and I said, Lou, I, and I'm still in contact with him to this day. I said, Lou, how do I get your job? <laughs> and, um, and he mentored me and I, and that's what I ended up being able to do. So I think dream big and break your goals down into things that are manageable. I mean, I think that that's a big part of it. So um, I've been, um, I got my MFA in photography at UC Santa Barbara, which is where I met our mutual friend, Max, and um, then have been at Cal Poly teaching for about 25 years. I absolutely love it. And, um, you know, I have never let technology or any of those things get in the way of a project or an idea that I had. I think you do the idea and you surround yourself with people who know how to do it better than you do and you learn from them. And so I think that has kind of been my motto my whole life in terms of working on the, the different things that I work on. And if people want to reach me, the best thing is just to email. It's just um, cybergman at email.com. And if you go to the, so you go to the Lives Well Live website, my email's there. I'm pretty responsive to emails, although lately I've been getting pretty inundated. <laughs> but yeah. I do answer everybody back. Um, I feel like if people take the time to email me, that I should email them back. And our social media, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and it's just Lives Well Live. So you can follow us there as well. And um, pretty good about posting where we are and what we're doing and all that kind of fun stuff. So that's been a whole other education, the whole social media thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm but looking forward to the weekend uh, seminar or, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the four-week online course, which has to happen because there's too many people <laughs> in this world to not hear this message, to not see the film, and not to learn. I mean, the fact that you're teaching length of life and that is just such an important piece that nobody really knows, but right. the people who are focusing on it tend to have the upper hand than the ones who just think, I live until I die. And mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing to be able to spend this time with you today. Sky Bergman, lives well lived. Super honored to have this interview. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was great. I really enjoyed every minute of it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.